As we're kind of, as I'm getting my little, my preparation here ready, because I'm already late. Big part of what we're doing in this, uh, which by the way, last week we sat down and we did net sheets. I know, I think everybody in this room still wants a copy of that net sheet. I will give that to you. But I think everyone would agree that even though we, the name of our class last week was net sheets, we talked a lot more about stuff that really had nothing to do with net sheets than actually filling out the addition and subtraction on how to fill out a seller's net sheet. Same thing with contracts. I think, I think a lot of agents in, in the office that see a contracts class, they then subsequently say, oh, they're just going to teach me how to, you know, check a box and fill it out. If you've sat through, who's sat through this class before, or at least a version thereof? Okay, I, I think you guys will, will agree that this is not, let's just go through page one and page two. We're going to give you some real life, um, hopefully some, some meaning um, behind doing this, um, doing these contracts. And at the same time, now we've got a really super fresh story in that meeting that I just got out of. And we'll see how we can apply some of that to the mistakes that were made in this particular deal. So with that in mind, um, does everybody have a copy of the contract? Yes. yes. Okay. We are going to, no. we're going to, do we have any answers? <laughs> oh, sorry guys. I, I, I got it. I got it. Okay. Got it. Well, we've got a couple more if anyone needs one. This is just a blank car contract. You should be looking at a revision date of April 2010. That's the most current. By the way, this is going to change. There is our, there, as a matter of fact, I think it hits, maybe we should not do this class and we should wait another month because CAR is revising the contract, oh, wow. I think, April of, of this year. So next month, we're going to have a new one. The reality is, it's not going to be that much different, and my class won't change all that much. Um, but um, um, today we're going to, since I started a little bit late, we will possibly go a little bit after 3 o'clock, but we're not going to do the four to six hour marathons that we've done before. To do this justice takes about six hours, so we'll get through page one and two maybe today, and then we'll go through from there. Um, but let's try to make this as interactive as we possibly can. And um, at the same time, um, you know, just ask as many questions as you can. If I think, you're, if I think you've kind of gone astray, then I will tell you to hold that question. What you got, Tom? Uh, was the one that you're talking about right now, was that a listing contract or was it a purchase contract? Well, it ultimately, the problem started with both. But okay. let's, let's start with just um, the agent in the office who failed was the listing agent. Okay. Their original failure had to do with um, had to do with a couple things. Let me ask you a question as I'm getting this pulled up. You take a listing today. Do we have an obligation to give the seller a copy of the agreement that they just signed? Yes. yes sir. When do you have an obligation to give that to them? Immediately. Immediately. At the time they sign it. Yeah. Right? Pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, if you don't do that, um, you are you violate every. That's, that's why we always used to have multi-part carbonless copies. So when they sign stuff, you give them a copy. Has that become a little bit of a problem in the age of wind forms? It's been a little bit of a problem in the age of wind forms. Now we don't have. I don't see any carbon copies on here. How am I supposed to get the people a copy? Okay. Well, you need to make an extra copy of it. Happen if you're. Who sits down with their sellers anymore, or their buyers, and sits across face to face to sign the contract? Okay. If, if possible, that's best practice. Have we, a lot of us gotten into the habit of um, doing everything over email? Mm -hmm. Email everything, right? God forbid, I'm going to have to sit down with somebody and, and, um, <laughs> and, and sign this stuff. I'm struggling with my password, you guys. Um, would it, would it be okay if you gave them the contract ahead of time to say this is what we're going over and then when Not I'm only would it be okay, it's, it's, prob it's, it's preferable. So they have a, they'll have a blank something to go over and then when we go over and want to get back to the office, does that qualify or is it not the same? It, it does. It, it does. Hold on a second. Let me give you a better answer than that. Ooh, we would call and find out what my password is. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Well, yeah, if you're filling it out, now you just change everything. This is the deal. We, and again, we could turn this, our contracts class could quickly turn into a listing presentation class. But let's just, let's talk generically. I'm going to sit down and you and I are going to take a list. You're my seller. I'm your agent. And my intention is that you are going to sign a listing contract with me tonight. Okay? Or change hats. You're my buyer 
and I'm going to sign a purchase contract, or you're going to sign a purchase contract with me tonight. In a perfect world, it'd be wonderful to get that information to you in advance. Okay? So, on a listing side, it might be a little bit easier. Okay? Hey, I'm going to sit down, sit down with you and Marilyn this evening, and we're going to fill out this paperwork, and I just want to give you something to look at before I get here, and, you know, check your email. Do you email? You, know, you don't email. Okay, well, let me have my assistant drop it off prior to our appointment, and you're going to have everything that we're going to cover. You're going to have the, the market analysis, you're going to have the disclosures, you're going to have the listing agreement, the whole nine yards, and I give it to you. And in theory, I give you an opportunity to digest it. You see what a professional I am. Oh my God, look at this package. I haven't even met with this guy yet. He's just giving me just a... That's it? Mm -hmm. Is that a capital there? Nope. Look at you. So, <laughs> at any rate, if you are a listing agent and you want to be a good listing agent, I would suggest, because normally, I just don't knock on your door, Tom, and say, hey, I'm in the neighborhood and want to know if you might want to sell your house. And you don't normally say, you got me at the right time. Come on in and let's do it, right? That's not normally how it works when you're taking a listing. Normally, there's multiple contacts. And then finally, we set the appointment. OK, when's a good time? That, when are you and Mrs. Rommel going to be home? Okay, great. You're going to go on Tuesday. Wonderful. So I might have hours or even days in advance to prepare. Well, if I know I've got hours or days in advance to prepare, well, this isn't my first listing, right? Who's taken more than one listing in this class? Okay, good. So I've learned over time that I don't want to prepare for my listing appointment with you 20 minutes before I go. I'm getting all my paperwork ready. I'm getting all done. My oh, damn, the printer's broken. Or my computer's failed. And now I got an appointment with you, which I've known about for four days, but because I didn't do it in advance, now I'm not prepared. So I know that. I've learned that lesson. So I have my entire package together. I've got my listing contract, I've got my agency, I've got my disclosures. I've already filled out a net sheet. Okay, my net sheet's done. All my disclosures are done. I've got a nice Cobalt Banker binder. My listing presentation, maybe I have a PowerPoint that I use, Cobalt Banker PowerPoint that says this is all the things that Tom Romo does to sell your house. And I'm the number one guy. And look at Cobalt Banker, and look at our advertising. And I got a YouTube video of Tom Selleck doing the commercial for Cobalt Banker. I got all that crap, right? Tom's techie. Tom likes email, so I say, Tom, check your email. Our appointment's tomorrow night at 2 o'clock, or tomorrow at 6 o'clock. I'm going to send you an email. Everything we're going to discuss is going to be in that email. Now, some of you might say, wait a minute, you really want to send them everything? That's up to you guys. If, that's, if your sales skills say, don't give them everything, just give them a piece, then fine. You do whatever your experience says. In my experience, I give you everything. Whole nine yards. You want me to give a CMA to my seller? that has a value, I basically, I think your house is worth 250 You want me to send that to him before I even meet with him? Because that's not traditional old school sales. Traditional old school sales is, what does the seller want to know? What's one of the things, that, there's two things that sellers want to know when they meet with you to list their house. One of them is what? How much is my property worth? <laughs> The second thing is, how much money am I going to walk away with? Yeah, walk away with. When do they normally want to know that? Right. Immediately. So if you walk in the door, old school sales would be, if Tom says, I have an list, how long is my list, how long is your guys' average listing appointment? How long would you spend on an hour to sell? A couple hours. That's, that's not bad. An hour would be, I think, a little short for me. Two hours would probably be a little long for me, but I certainly could do a two-hour listing presentation, okay? Now, old school sales says that the very first thing Tom says is, well, Lance, you know, just tell me what it's worth. My sales trainer would say, deflect that question. Oh, hey, Tom, we're going to get to that in a little bit. Let me take a look at the house. I'm going to sit down. i got a whole bunch of information. I'd like to go with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I would, you know, you deflect that. Do sellers realize that? They don't just an answer the damn question. What's, the, what's it worth? I'm on the, I'm on the lot uh, buying a car. How much is it? Well, do they ever tell you how much it is? Well, why don't you come into the office? Mm -hmm. Come on, let's sit down. I got this thing called the four square. Anybody's been to a car deal with the four square? Does that drive you mad? I bought a lot of cars. I've never once been able to have a salesman tell me, what can I buy this car for on the lot? I've never once had a salesman say, you can buy this car for $44,000. You want to buy it or not? Never. It's like, oh, come on, let's come in. Let me put you in there. All right. Same thing. I, so I think we are, this is realtors, <laughs> car salespeople, 
ask the public. Car salespeople have surpassed us in reputation amongst the public. Are you kidding me? Partially is because we're not giving them information as quickly and honestly as, as we can. So I'm way off topic because I want to get back to the contract. But the bottom line is if I can get that information to you in advance, including what the list price I think is going to be, including what I think your net's going to be, I want to give it to you. I want you to have digested the agreement, whether it's the listing agreement or the purchase contract. So when I get there, which I, by the way, I'm going to have a completely fresh set. We're going to go through. We're going to do our thing. Hopefully we're going to sign on the line that is dotted. And then, do I have an extra copy to give you in my briefcase? Yes, because I'm prepared. If I don't have an extra copy because I'm not prepared, hopefully you've already got the one that I dropped off on your porch the day before. That's an identical copy. I'll tell you what, as long as we're at it, let's just, do, let's just sign both of these. Okay? Have you guys ever sat anywhere and signed contracts where they have you sign originally copies for the exact same thing? Well, you can do that in real estate too. Perfectly fine to have your buyer sign two original copies. One copy is for you to keep, Mr. Buyer. One copy is for me to present to the, to the listing agent. Okay, so at any rate, we're going to talk a little bit about this example. Let's first off, let's just pull up a contract. Let's get rolling. We'll start to jump into my 20-minute little sidebar conference here with my, with my agent. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull up a copy of the contract and we are going to, which by the way, I'm in wind forms for those of you watching at home. Hopefully that's centered properly. I didn't even check to see if our camera is looking good. It is. Yeah. yeah, that looks about as good as any. Um, so I'm in wind forms. Um, I would suggest to everybody, if you are not using wind forms to draft your contracts, start. Um, technically, printing out a blank wind forms contract, filling it out by hand. It's very, it's acceptable. I mean, you guys have heard the thing in real estate licensing school, you can write a contract on the back of a cocktail napkin, it's legally binding? Yes, it is. Is it the most professional way to do it? No, it's not. Um, we are professionals, let's act like it, and when we are going to present a new contract to a listing agent, we want it to look like we know what we're doing. So, in my opinion, um, looking like we know what we're doing means we're going to use the RPA, Residential Purchase Agreement. Here it is, our PA. Uh, by the way, everybody understands the acronyms. Nothing more embarrassing than you're now under contract and you're talking to the other agent and the other agent says, could you send me a copy of the RPA? And you're like, huh? Send you what? RPA. What do you want? <laughs> What's the RPA? What language are you speaking? Um, so knowing what you're um, knowing what you're looking at always helps. Always helps just a little bit. That my, my computer is in desperate need to be replaced. Yeah, right there. It won't do that. Just struggling. Why am I struggling so much here? Maybe it won't do that now. I just did it won't this. do that. That's the it's fixed now. So it won't do that. Yeah, it's fixed. What? Yeah. I think it's broken. No, bro. See those button, the, the buttons, buttons on the, the top, top, top there. See the eye. Um, the no, 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 that one. Which one? Was there a little more? A little to the left. Keep going. Keep more going. There, keep going. There. Down a little Down bit. Down a little bit. Yeah, right there. Right there. That's what I just did. Yeah. yeah here we go. go. I just did that. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So at any rate, RPA, Residential Purchase Agreement. Okay. Who's been in this business for more than a couple of years? About more than 10 years. Who remembers, what did we used to call this? Deposit the deposit receipt. You haven't been in this business that long, but mom has. And you better be paid attention to the deposit receipt. If you have an agent that says, hey, shoot me over a copy of the deposit receipt, number one, they're telling you a couple things. They've been around for a little while. Because this has not been called a deposit receipt. Welcome. 20 push-ups. 20 push-ups. Um, <laughs> I used to teach martial arts classes. If you showed up late, you did push-ups. You are 30 minutes late. Like, excuse me, you have to do 30 push-ups. I was say, only 20? You're pretty soft. That's right. So, um, at any rate, if you have somebody say, send me over a copy of the deposit receipt, that means a couple things. They're older mentality. I, I've done that a couple times, talking about, yeah, send me the deposit receipt. To catch myself, this has not been called a deposit receipt for probably 10 years. Okay? Having said that, this is still... 
the deposit receipt, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And what's a deposit receipt? Just hold that question, we're going to get to a little bit. So, um, this is also joint escrow instructions. Is that new? Let's say, is new defined as 10 years or, or less? It's not new. It's really not new, okay? Um, the contract, which by the way, I use the word contract a lot. Is this a contract? Okay. Let's go back to some of our sales training. If I want to get Tom to sign a contract, do I call it a contract? No. Because when I say contract, that's scary. You've always were told by your mom and dad, don't ever sign a contract, right? But will you sign an agreement? Yes. Of course you will sign an agreement. Or will you sign the paperwork? Of course you would. What if, would you just do me a favor and just put your initials right here on the agreement? <laughs> What's an agreement? Yeah. Okay. Just on the paperwork. Just let me just get you to sign on the paperwork here a little bit. Does that work for you? But as soon as I say, would you sign the contract, what happens? All the little bells go off, defense mechanisms go up, and of course your instincts say don't sign that. Okay? Well, guess what? This is 2013. Okay? We are not car salespeople. We are real estate professionals. I like calling this a contract because that's exactly what it is. And I don't want people to misunderstand the fact that this is a contract. And if it's going to scare Tom to sign a contract, then I don't want him to sign the damn thing. Okay? So call it what it is, but again, you will, even this, we don't call it a contract. I'm on the board of directors at CAR. I'm on the standard reforms committee. I've been on that committee for 20 years. You know how long I've been trying to get them to change that damn word? Call it a purchase contract. Okay? We didn't come to contract, that's scary. At any rate, so here we are, California Residential Purchase Agreement, RPA, and again, I know I'm talking really basic elementary stuff here, and joint escrow instructions. So, is it important that this property, or this contract or agreement is filled out properly? <coughs> yes, for two reasons. Number one, it is a contract, it is legally binding between your buyer and your seller, and also, it's your escrow instructions. So don't screw it up. In the old days, you would sign a contract between a buyer and seller. You would then give that contract to the escrow company. And what would the escrow company do? They would retype it. They would retype everything on here, and they would issue escrow instructions. Okay, now, some escrow companies still do that. And the reason they still do that is because they don't trust us to fill out the paperwork properly. Okay? But if we have filled out the paperwork properly, the escrow company says, why should we interpret the documents that the buyer and seller have already agreed to? Because this is what they've already agreed to. All right? All the more reason we got to fill it out properly. We can't guess. We can't um, just, oh, geez, I really don't know that. But I know Lance says something about it in the contract, so I'm just going to leave that blank. We'll figure that part out later. Oops. going to be a little bit of a problem. Okay, so here we are. With our California RPA joint escrow instructions, the very first thing that you get to fill out is a date. Is the date important? Yes. yes. Did you expect for me to take 20 minutes and talk about the date when you came signed up for this class? Probably not. Could I talk for 20 minutes about the date? I could. I won't, but I could. Okay. Everything in this contract revolves around a certain trigger in time, which is triggered off of this date. First of all, very important, if I'm going to sit down, Tom, you're going to be my example today. If I'm going to sit down with Tom, um, and which is now called Charles, if I'm going to sit down with Charles, and I expect you as my buyer to sign a purchase agreement or purchase contract today, I want the date of this contract to be what? Yeah. Today. So if you do get in the habit of saying, hey, guess what, I know we're not going to be able to meet until Saturday. I'm going to type up all the paperwork in advance, contract. I'm going to email it to you. I'm going to leave a couple things blank. I'm going to leave some dates blank. I'm going to leave the price blank. A couple other things we haven't talked about. But 95% of it's going to be filled out. just want you to take a look at it. And when we get together on Saturday, all we got to do is you know, fill in a date, fill in a price, and sign it. Good with that? Great. Now, what I've seen happen a lot is agents do that, which is a good thing. But they'll put in the date of today. They'll meet with Tom and his wife on Saturday. And then what date do you sign the contract? Well, it's different. It's a different date than what's on the contract. You're going to cause yourself some heartburn, okay? So whenever possible, which is all the time, make the date of the contract the date that they sign it, okay? 
Now, it doesn't necessarily make it uh, invalid. If the date on page one is today and this contract signed date on page eight is two days later, it's still a valid contract. But you're potentially going to cause yourself some problems and confusion when people start counting dates. When are we going to close? How many days do we have on inspection windows? The seller is counting from one date, you're counting from another date, and now all of a sudden you're in a fight over when did, when did the 17 days start? Did the 17 days start from this date or did the 17 days start from when Tom signed it? What's the answer to the question? The date he signed it. The date he signed it. But do you want to have that argument? No. You don't want to have that argument, even if you're right, and you would be right. Well, geez, I know it says this date, but he signed it five days later, so we didn't start until five days later, which that may not even be true, because the seller might not have signed it until five days after that, right? Right. So then when did our 17 days start? Five days after that. Five, the day five the seller signed it, five days after that. But again, clean contract sell. So the date they're going to sign it is when they want to do it. Um, uh, uh, page one, paragraph one, item A. Charles Bentley. Is our client, is your name Charles Bentley? What's your name? Charles A. Are you Charles A? Is that how you want to hold title, Charles A? Are you really Charles A? What's the A for? Uh, That's for no, A is for Adamant. What? Andrew. No, it's for Adamant. Adamant? What the hell is that? That's a little nickname my parents gave me. It's stuck. Is that your legal name? Well, no, my middle initial really is T for Thomas. Well, what the hell is this A? I just stuck with me. You know, they called me Charles Adamant Bentley, and I've just used that middle initial forever. Are you legally middle initial A? No. Okay. If Charles A. Bentley, Adam Bentley, is your real name, and that's how you want to hold title, that's what we put up here. Don't come to me later and say, oh, I wish I wouldn't have said middle initial A, I want it to be Adam. I want to spell it out. Okay? Spell it out. Are you a junior? Are you a senior? Are you this? Is there a difference between Charles Bentley Jr. and Charles Bentley II? Yeah. Yes. yes. There's a difference. And if you're a junior or you're the second, you know the difference. Okay? We got to get that in there. Is your wife holding title? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I don't know. I talked to Brad. Right, so there might be a little problem with my wife's credit, and maybe, maybe I need to go by my own. Really? Okay. Are you sure about that? Yeah. Let's get Brad on the phone. Let's make sure you understand what he told you. Are you you're really going to be holding title by yourself, independent of your wife? Is that really what Brad intended to say? Because you might have misunderstood him. He might have said the exact opposite. He might have said, well, geez, your wife's credit is a little beat up, but... Because of the relationship, we need her income, and we're just going to have to deal with it, and we're going to throw it in there, and she has to. You, you can't qualify on your own. So you've got to use both of you, even though we've got a little problem here to deal with. Same thing with your wife. Who is she? What's her middle name? Is she a junior? Is she a senior? Is she hyphenated? Is she a, a Romo Bentley? How does she do Romo Bentley? Is it Romo Bentley? Is it Romo Dash Bentley? Is it... I don't know. Is this important? Yes. Yes. If you make a mistake, is this correctable? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, to give you real life examples with REO properties, we have had Charles Bentley write an offer on a property and get the offer accepted by Fannie Mae. Then, three days, four days later, whether this is fair or this sounds like the right thing to do, just check your logic at the door for a moment. Three days later, Charles' agent calls me and says, oh, we need to add Mrs. Bentley. Or Charles forgot to tell me in middle initial A for Adam. We need to modify that. Okay, now under normal circumstances, under normal world, that wouldn't, it'd be an inconvenience. God, are you really, God, I've got to draw a memo, i got to get a sign, really? But you get it done, you go about your business, everything's fine. Sent these real life stories. By the way, nothing I'm going to say today is made up. Everything I'm telling you is from real life experience. Sent the offer into the bank. The bank says, oh, okay. Um, how many other offers have we had on this property? It looks like we had 17 offers when we accepted Charles' offer the first time. Um, pretty hot property. Anything else going on, Lance, since this has um, come up? Well, yeah, indeed. I've got actually six more. Um, Anything better than what Charles sent in? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact. Great. 
Tell Charles to come back with highest and best. We're going to reopen the offer round. We're going to take a look at new offers. Does that sound fair? Does that sound? No, it doesn't sound fair to me. I got a yes out of you, but I was looking, I was looking for a no. It happens all the time. Um, now, be, and you know whose fault that is? That's Charles' agent's fault. That's Sally Snowflake's fault because she didn't fill out the darn paperwork right. And we can argue that we're blue in the face whether the asset manager is being reasonable and whether they're treating Charles and his wife properly or not. It doesn't matter. That happens. That happens all the time. Let me give you a little different scenario. Uh, let's replace Charles. Charles Bentley is not a person. Charles Bentley is, a, is, a, is an entity. You are an LLC. You are a corporation. You are whatever you happen to be. Tom is the president of the Charles Bentley Group, Incorporated, LLC, whatever it happens to be. It's amazing how many people who are the president of a corporation do not know the name of their incorporation, of their corporation. What's the name of your, oh, we're the Charles Bentley Group, Inc. Okay, I, okay, let me get this right. Charles Bentley Group, is that comma? INC period, or is that no comma incorporated? Does it make a difference? Yeah. Yes, it absolutely makes a difference. Now, in the now partial, let's forget about what I just said about Fannie Mae. Let's just suppose Charles Bentley comma Inc. We now get into escrow. Escrow's drafted all the paperwork. Everything's good. Prior to close of escrow, a title company's going to want to see some documents, right? What are they going to want to see? Corporate documents, you know, um, articles of incorporation, resolution, signing off. The, off are you the so authorized party? Authorized. By the way, has anybody had an experience where you're dealing with Tom the entire time? He signed all the paperwork. The name of the corporation is right. You get ready to, you know, close escrow. Title opens up. Gets the document. They find out, dude, you're not even the authorized signer. I'm not the officer. You're not the author. You're not the authorized <laughs> officer to sign. <laughs> Who's Sally? Oh shit. Oh. <laughs> really? Yeah, go get her. Gee, Sally's gone. She's gone. She's an officer and director of the corporation with the authority to sign. You better go get her. Okay? Now, granted, bigger corporations don't normally have these types of problems, but, you know, small family, mom and pops, you know, you opened a corporation 10 years ago, you think you know what you're doing. But all that stuff's important, and you got to get it right. Even if you make a mistake, easily fixed, but you do not want to be the agent representing... Charles Bentley Incorporated, getting ready to close escrow tomorrow. And again, this would be a bad timing. There's a whole bunch of people. I, if this scenario happened, I'd blame me, I'd blame escrow, I'd blame title, probably a couple other three people in there like blame. Let's suppose I'm getting ready to close tomorrow, and my escrow officer calls and says, oh, we did the recording on um, Wembley Circle got pulled because we got to modify the grant deed. What do you mean? It's not Charles Bentley comma, I-N-C, period. It's Charles Bentley, no comma, incorporated, spelled out. That's the legal name of your corporation. There's a difference, okay? So get that stuff straightened out. If you are basically going to write offers for corporations, ask them in advance. Hey, Tom, I know we're going to sit down on Saturday, and you told me that you have an investment company that you used to buy and sell properties and flip. Um, give me a copy of your articles of incorporation. Now, if, you're, if I'm talking to Tom, and he looks at me like, huh, red flag, red flag, especially if he's told me he's bought and sold a bunch of properties under his corporation, because if he really has bought and sold a bunch of properties under his corporation, me asking him for his order of incorporation, not only is going to send a signal to him that I know what the hell I'm talking about, he's going to fully expect it. He says, oh yeah, I got it, I got the whole file, I got the bylaws, I got the articles, I got the most recent minutes. I've got the signing authority that says that I'm the, I'm the authorized signer. I, unless I have all that stuff. Now, what, if, what is, has my confidence level just increased with my buyer? If my buyer literally looks at me like, I'm not confident. I have no confidence in you. Especially, I'll probably call you out. I'll probably call you out. I think I, think I mentioned this in, this, in the, in the net sheet class last week. The older I get, the little less... Um, sensitive I've become to people's feelings. Okay, I think the story I told last week is I take a listing, I go in, and there's cat poop and just smells terrible all over the place. And in the old days, I'd go in, and, oh, geez, let's get the listing. And, well, you know, I got a good name of a carpet cleaner. Let me get you this, just so you know. And get the thing on stage. Now I go in, I'm like, 
Tom, <laughs> what are you going to do about this? What are you talking about? This. There's that, actually that right there. What are you talking about? You mean the cat poop on the floor? Yeah, that. <laughs> Not just the poop on the floor, the whole house. I can't sell this. I certainly can't sell it for this. If you want to take this and sell it as is, that's fine. But why would you do that? And I, and I apologize, but your house smells like cat pee. And there's literally poop on the carpeting that you haven't picked up. It looks like in six months. What are you going to do about that? So, you know, a little bit in your face. Getting back to our corporate documents situation. If Tom has told me to my face that he bought and sold six properties this year through your corporation, and then I ask him for articles of incorporation, I'm calling bullshit. And dude, you know, I love you and I want to work with you. You just told me you bought six properties since, since January 1 through Charles Bentley Incorporated. I'm the first person to ask you for articles of incorporation. You're looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. By the way, let me explain to you how I get paid. Okay? I don't get paid unless we successfully close this transaction. I've been doing this for a little while. Now, some of you can't say that necessarily, but, but project confidence. You know what you're talking about. I've done this long enough to know that I, a red flag just went up the pole. Okay, Robert, a red flag just went up the pole. You should know what I'm talking about when I say articles and corporation. Be honest with me. You know, I know people who tend to puff our resume a little bit. Have you really closed six deals? Were those your dad's deals? I mean, I don't know. But I would much rather have that confrontational meeting today and actually maybe even get fired. Maybe if you walk, <laughs> I'll dare you question me, mm -hmm. then spend the next three months, or even three days, or three weeks, finding out that you're full of baloney, because you don't have those documents. Okay, so here we are, line one, this offer is from, know who your buyer is, that's the rule, that's the lesson here, know who your buyer is, okay, got it? Let's pretend this is a listing agreement, know who your seller is, just because I'm in front of Mr. and Mrs. Seller, don't assume that Mr. and Mrs. Seller are the only people on title, or the people on title. Can I trust my property profile? Page one of my property profile says, John Seller, Sally Seller. There's John, there's Sally. Looks like I'm good. Well, can you fit three names on page one of a property profile? Not more normally, you can't. Well, now you find out Sally's mom is on title. Sally's mom is dead. They don't have the proper documentation to deal with her death. At a minimum, we've delayed our escrow. Maybe killed it. Okay? Um, so you need to know it. Now, if you get a full profile and it's got a copy of the most recent deed, in theory, can you trust that? The deed said, which is this is why you want to get this information in advance. I want to know. Hey, John and Sally, I've been talking, Tom, I've been talking to you for the whole time. And I, I met Sally once on the porch, and I pulled up the profile before I meet it, and I see there's three other people on here. Well, who are those people? Oh, that's my mom and dad and, and Sally's brother's sister's cousin. Well, you know they're on title. How many people, i got five people who own the house. How many need to sign to list the house for sale? One. One to list, five to sell. Okay. So i got five owners on title. Um. I can sit down with Tom, Tom can list the property, and frankly, Tom can obligate himself to pay me a commission, okay? But Tom cannot sell the property without the other four, the other yeah. four signatures. Yeah. If you have five buyers and only one on, is allowed to put it on the market, so the others five, don't agree. Five, five, five sellers. Five sellers, okay. Yeah. The others don't agree to, to it, putting it on the market, right. then he's in trouble, or we're yeah. in trouble. He's contractually obligated potentially to pay me. I've wasted my time. At the end of the day, by the way, how do we get paid? We get paid at close of escrow. I don't get paid by running around suing sellers for commissions. I don't want, is that what I want to do? I don't want to run around and sue Tom because I was an idiot and didn't find out that there was four other people on title. That is not a good use of our time. Okay. Having said that, if he signs as the seller, I can legally put the, let's do, let's do a more realistic scenario. It's Tom and Sally, okay? Sally is away for the weekend, wife. 
sit down with Tom. Hey, Tom, then work. You and Sally are on title. You guys, you want to get this going right away. Yeah, I believe him. I trust him. Everything's good. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and sign the listing today, just with you. Ideally, I need to get Sally, just so you understand. And I don't mean to, I don't mean to, you know, probe. But you, everything's cool with you and Sally, right? Sally wants to sell the house, right? Because if, if there's any daylight between you and Sally on the decision to sell this house, we're wasting our time because you can sign the listing agreement that helps me get the property going, but if Sally's not willing to sign this, we're wasting our time. Oh, well, Lance, I wasn't exactly honest with you. I don't know. She's at her attorney's office right now. Really? Yeah, because she really doesn't want to sell. She wants me to buy her out, and she wants to stay. And I'm like, okay, that's a little different situation. But let's suppose the situation is a little more common, and a little more common meaning that um, Sally is just away from the weekend. Tom signs, everything's fine. We get an offer again. Tom signs as the seller, and Sally signs as the seller. Everything's happy. Okay. So again, know who your clients are. Know what your address is. Spell it out. Is it Wembley? One thing I've realized, I've been doing a lot, working with a lot of buyers lately, it's amazing how many different Wembleys there are. In the same city, Wembley Court, Wembley Circle, Wembley Drive, Wembley, you know, really? In, in Menifee, you've got three different Wembleys? So know what you're selling, get your address down there, spell it out properly, don't abbreviate circles, spell it out, get the zip code correct. Address is pretty straightforward. Um, Take the time, by the way, this is auto-populated, so there's some information filled out on here, but 99% of this contract is blank. Get the assessor's parcel number, run a profile, you don't even have to get a profile anymore, you can just pull it right up on real estate tax through the MLS. Make sure everything jives, assessor parcel number, one, two, three, four, five, whatever it happens to be. Properties in the city of Menifee, properties in the county of Riverside, fill it out, put it in, okay? Purchase price. Um, again, I'm not, we do a completely separate class on offer negotiations and offer presentations. So I'm not going to go through how we decide to offer 250 or whatever it happens to be. So let's just for now just assume we've already, we've already agreed to that much. So we're going to put, you guys know how this works in wind forms. When I type in 250,000, it types in the handwritten boost. Two oh, they're just like that. Cool. I told you, property values are going up. Going up. Okay. Just one deal. So, put this <laughs> on. Amen. That's, That's Manaphy, baby. We're all going to Manaphy. All Six percent. That's right. So, um, anyway, so we got we got a nice sale. We got a two point five million dollar sale. Okay. Um, close of escrow. Now, again, for some of you, this is you're going to hear this till it's blue in the face. We, how many options do we have on this line? Class two. participation, two. two. Okay, two. you can put in it. Let me let me just move past this. Yeah. Okay, oh. you can put in a date, or you can put in a check the box in so many days. Most of you know how do I? What do I like? I like a date. date. Are there problems putting in a date? Yes. Yes. Okay. In my opinion, there are more problems in putting in a thirty days, or forty days, or sixty days. Okay. Now again. Having said that, and Robin's shaking her head. I don't know if she's shaking her head because she disagrees with me. or I she disagree. Just, she does. Okay, good. So we're going to argue about this. Okay? <laughs> now, this is the deal. And having said well, that, I got an argument, too. That's right. <laughs> the conventional 90% the conventional mm -hmm. of our um, agents out there, and I'm talking good quality agents, put in 30 days from acceptance. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, I just personally don't like it. I personally prefer to plug in a date. And I like a date for a bunch of reasons. And again, this comes from my personal experience. In my personal experience, people tend to start counting uh, different days and different time. So again, Tom's gonna be my buyer. I'm pulling up my, my um, contact management system. I'm pulling up my calendar. Today is... Um, I'm looking over here for a second. Okay, today is March 21st. When do you want to close? When do you want to close? 30 days. 30 days. 30 days is normal. Have you talked to Brad? By the way, everyone knows Brad, right? Global Banker Mortgage. Why is it important that you talk to Brad? So he'll close in 30 days. Because you want to close in 30 days, but he's got other ideas, son. You're like, you 
you are a work in progress. You may not be able to close it all yet alone in 30 days. Now, Brad says, no problem. Then I say, no problem. Brad says, no, 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 I need 45. Now, my conversation with Brad, and by the way, sometimes this happens in reverse. This happens all the time, guys. The lender gives me a letter, or we have a conversation with the lender on behalf of his buyer. The lender said, I can close it in 30 days. Really? Well, yeah. So if I, which by the way, if Brad told me that, 30 days, I would say, so if I put the contract at 45, we have no problem, correct? Well, of course, because I just told you 30 days. Now, you may say, wait a minute, what am I doing here? Why am I going out 45 days? Maybe the house is vacant. Maybe that's not all that critical. Because I want, what I want to do is I want to put Brad's um, um, hands in a vice. Okay? Um, you can insert another word in there if you'd like. And the vice is the following. When I get to day 30, which is, which by the way, when is 30 days from? Sunday. No, no. Monday. Today's March. Let's just suppose we write the offer today and we get the offer accepted today. Just, okay, just look at the calendar. Okay, here's 20th my, of April. 20th, 20th, what else? 24th. Everybody, 20 what? 20, I got a different, I got a different date. 24th. 20th, 24th. Five, six, seven, Somebody's eight, counting. Eight, One, two, three. 19th. 19th? I've already got three different answers. Okay? So, 30 days from acceptance. 17. You start counting the next day. One, two, three, four. Oh, wait, wait, do I count the Saturdays and Sundays? Yes. 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 One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, 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 why not Friday? Yeah. You said Friday. Monday. Why can't we close Friday? 29 days. Well, it is 29 days, but why can't we close? Contract says 30. What county are you in? What county am I in? <laughs> what county? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Push All right. So, for this reason, is why I don't like 30 days. I don't like 45 days. I don't like 60 days. I want to sit down with my buyer and my lender, and I want to say, Brad says he can get it done in 30 days. Brad, Tom, okay. that puts us basically here. Okay, are there any holidays in April? Is there any holidays around this? Easter, so. When's Easter? Easter? Friday. March. Okay, wait a minute. So the 19th. Well, hell, I got Coachella that, that oh, Friday. Oh, I can't do it. Can't do it. <laughs> hey, honest to God, do you sometimes, and by the way, I certainly would disclose it to my client, just so you know, buddy, you're setting the close of escrow date that I'm not going to be in, in town. I'm going to be available. I'll be available by phone. I'll be available by email. But I'm telling you right now, I'm not even going to be in town that day. That could be a problem. Sometimes I need to be there, and I need to do something. But just so you know, that day I can't make it. Now, you may say, I don't get a rip, Lance, because that's the only weekend that I have off. That's the only weekend I can move. Which now I'm hearing something. My buyer is telling me the only time he can move is this weekend. Wait a minute. The only time? What happens if we, for some reason, this guy screws up? It's always his fault, right? <laughs> right. Okay. So this guy, it's never your fault. It's never my fault. It's never escrow, title, the termite guy, the home inspector, the, the assistant. It's always the lender's fault. Yeah. What happens if this guy screws up and we don't close? Well, if we don't close by the 19th, I'm not buying the house. Uh -oh. Do I want to know that little piece of information? Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Okay. Now, now, sometimes that's going to be extreme. Maybe that's an extreme situation because that's just an extreme situation. But are there situations where the buyer legitimately says, if I do not close by December 31st, I'm not interested in buying or if I do not close by the time my um, 1031 exchange date expires, expires, I'm not interested in buying. Are there some legitimate hard dates where, where Tom mm -hmm. could say, if it doesn't close by this date and this time, I don't want to buy? Yeah. Now, the answer he just gave me is nonsense. The only reason you have to move is the only weekend you have off. I want to know that about you. So I'm setting my date. He tells me 30 days. I sit down with my lender and my lender says, yeah, I can do it 30 days, no problem. I sit down with Tom. I say, Tom, I'll tell you what. Let's do this. Let's just give Brad an extra week. 
What do you say we close on the on the twenty six? Which, by the way, I oh shoot, stage coach call. Damn. Conference. <laughs> okay, but by the way, I gave him an extra week. Um, are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm fine. The house, let's just pretend for a minute the house is vacant, so we don't have to worry about sellers moving out. They want to close as soon as you can. We haven't even presented the offer to the seller yet. So I said, okay, the twenty six. We feel the yeah, he's on that one. Now, is there possibly a reason I might not want to close on Friday the 26th? Give me a reason why I might not want to close on Friday the 26th. How about because it's Friday? Well, is sometimes is sometimes it a little harder to close escrow on a Friday than maybe on a Thursday? Yes. That close, yeah, to, the, that close to the end of the month, yes. Sometimes, well, we're going to get to the end of the month in a minute. But sometimes Friday can be a little bit of a problem. And let me ask you a question. Let's suppose I said... Let's suppose we, we tell Tom, by the way, we're going to close on the 26th. The house is vacant. This, everything's agreed upon. Not a big deal. So what does Tom start doing? What's me making plans for? He's making plans to move in on the 27th. Rental chart, family, friends, everything's in place. Now we chose, we chose, we, realtor, professional, said, Tom, we're going to close your deal on, on Friday the 26th. Sometimes Fridays are a challenge. Again, whose fault is it because we didn't close? It's Brad's fault because <laughs> he's the lender. The loan didn't fund in time. Forget about the fact the loan didn't fund is because he was waiting on one more paycheck stub for you that he asked you for three weeks ago, but you finally gave it to him here, and he pulled a miracle out of his hat and drew docs and got it ready to fund. But he funded it after... The cutoff to record for the county recorder's office. Which means what? Monday close. Which means we didn't close and you can't move in. So you're you're moving truck. So what do you, what is so what does Tom do? Ring ring, hey Lance, Tom. Actually let's, let's rephrase that. Ring ring, hey Tom, it's Lance. Dude, I got bad news. Which by the way, deliver bad news as fast as you possibly can. Don't sit on bad news. Number one, it'll eat you alive, and number two, it'll bite you in the ass. Later on, I find out bad news, I deliver it immediately. The bad news that I found out is we did not record because Brad didn't get the wire sent out, which really isn't Brad's fault, it's your fault, but we'll leave that aside for a minute. So I call you up, Tom, ring, ring, Lance here. Oh, dude, I have good news, bad news. Let me just cut right to it. We didn't close today. Didn't get the wire in time. We missed the recording cutoff. We're not going to be able to record until the 29th. And I'm sorry about it, but you can't move into the house. Yes. Perfect example here. I get it out by 2.30. I made it. I pulled a miracle out of my, you know what? He thinks he's a hero. Think I'm a hero. Escrow goes, guess what? Chase, who we're paying off, shut off all wires at 1 o'clock. Yeah. They don't accept the payoff yet. Till yep. Monday morning, they want three more days interest. Yep. Oh, so, oh, by the way, the good news is. Now i got to pull the wire. Read you're wearing it for, well, we've got time to pull the wire. The good news is, is not only did we not close escrow, and not only did you get to move in, the loan is funded, so they're charging you interest for Friday, Saturday, Sunday on a house you don't even own. Did that happen all the time? Mm -hmm. it happens all the time. So, again, we could go down this path for another hour. Closing escrows on Friday sometimes can be a challenge. So if Tom, if we're having, and again, by the way, we're writing the offer, guys. We're not even on page, we're not even uh, halfway through page one. I'm talking to my client. I'm negotiating with my, which by the way, you don't always have all of this information when you're sitting down and writing the offer. You're pulling this information out. How many times have I showed him properties prior to writing this offer? How much time have I spent with him in the car, at the property? 90% of what I need to know, I should already know. I'm ha I'm, I've got the contract in my head. Dude, what's up with your movie? What's your plans? You've got to be in by when. Why? What is, is that important? You know, all that sort of stuff. So I should already know. So if that, if that date, move-in date, is critical to him, I probably want to sit down and I want to schedule a close of escrow date, maybe here, maybe the 23rd, 24th, 25th. It gives me a cushion, okay? That way I close a couple days early. Now, you may own the house a couple days early, but at least you're ready for your moving truck, okay, if that's a big deal. Now, if Tom says, doesn't matter, dude, doesn't matter. I'm super flexible. I don't care if it closes on Monday or Friday or I don't care. By the way, what's another difficult day to close escrows on? Month end? Oh, end of, end of the month. Month end is month end. Everybody has to close month end. 
don't ask me why we always have to close month end. I know there's motivations for commissions and mortgage guys like to close because their commissions get paid in there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes escrow officers have an incentive. Asset managers at banks, oh my God, if it doesn't make month end, the world's going to come to an end. Are you kidding me? Okay. Do everything you can to avoid closing escrow at month end. Let's go to a more realistic situation. Once for, ah, okay, 4th of July, guys. We're now writing an offer in June. 4th of July is a Thursday. This week is screwed. Okay, if I can avoid it, there is no way I am trying to schedule an escrow to close 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, or 5th. But wait a minute, Lance. The, everyone's open on the 1st, the 2nd, and the 3rd, and they might even be open on the 5th. They might be open, but half their staff's on vacation. They're at the river, they're gone. I don't want to, there's no way in hell I'm trying, and actually I don't even want to try, I don't want to schedule a close of escrow for this day either. The Monday after a holiday? Are you kidding me? The, the chances of getting an escrow closed, number one, it's a stupid day to close an escrow. On the Monday the 8th after the 4th, of July. are you kidding me? I mean, you're just asking for trouble. But this is the thing. I'm trying to convey a message that let's minimize the trouble that you guys are going to run into. And sometimes you ask for trouble and you don't even realize it. Especially, everyone loves the holidays, right? You love the holidays? <laughs> okay. Well, when's Thanksgiving fall? Always, it's the 20... The 21st. The 21st. Okay. You want to close an extra this week? No. Not if you can avoid it. Frankly, do you want to close one this week? Not if you can avoid it. Now, again, if, if that's just what it has to be, then you take charge and then I tell you. Okay, dude, you are asking for trouble, okay? But you insist. Brad says he can do it. You have to do it. We're going to try to close on the 26. Wednesday before Thanksgiving so that you can spend the Thanksgiving holiday with your family and moving boxes. And you insist, right? Okay, you're an idiot. I probably would couch a little bit differently than that, but I would warn my client, you're asking for trouble. And obviously, you know the following month is, is even more difficult. Now we're in December. Okay, well, isn't this great? And again, I think about closing Decembers now. I certainly, if I'm not thinking about them now, I sure as heck am thinking about them in August and September because I want to know. I don't want to make any mistakes. What a great time of the month for Christmas to fall this year. This entire week is dead. Okay. This entire week is dead. So if you have a client, mark my words now, you have a client later on in the year that is insisting, I have to close escrow by the end of the year for whatever reason, tax reasons or whatever it happens to be. Okay, let me get my calendar out. Okay, what you're really telling me is that we need to close escrow sometime in the week of the 16th. Ideally, no later than the 20th. But what do you mean no later than the 20th? We got extra time. No, we don't. We don't have extra. Now, in reality, can we close an escrow on December 31st? Yes, we can. We don't want to put our clients in that situation. We're asking for trouble. Now, where these things become a little bit more difficult is just the random holidays. It's, it's uh, Martin Luther King Day. Nobody really realized it 30 days before. It's President's Day. Nobody really realized it 30 days before. You've got people expecting you to do something, and guess what? The holiday, holiday just caused you nothing to heart from. So, I like hard dates. Okay? Now Robin can tell you, wait a minute, I wrote the offer today. I put a hard date of whatever it is, which is approximately, let's just say, 40 days out. But it took me nine days to get the offer accepted, or ten days to get the offer accepted, or, or three weeks to get the offer accepted. Okay? Well, when that happens, we're adjusting the date. We're going back to, hey, guys, I submitted this offer to you three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, I was ready to close on April 7th. Now it's April 3rd. Okay. Well, wait a minute. I need now I need until April 28th or whatever it happens to be. So I like hard dates. If you don't go with hard dates, just this is my suggestion if you put in 30 days from acceptance. Once that offer is accepted, you get everybody on the same page. Buyer, seller, escrow, title, Brad. Everybody is on the same page. This is okay. I'm gonna use a word and I'm gonna take it back immediately. Our target date, <laughs> right? What's, what word am I taking back? Target. Our target date <laughs> it's our drop dead is date. April 19th. No. Our con 
contract date is April 19th. Is there a difference? Yes. Mm -hmm. Normal. I mean, I don't know. If I've got a target date, target, okay, target. I'm going to shoot the dartboard at the target, and I'm going to hope that I make it. And if you shoot darts the way I throw darts, I'm going to miss. Most agents, if I had a nickel for every time I heard this, you, 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 talk, you talk to it. By the way, red flag, red flag. You're, you're a week or two weeks away from escrow. Your lender or the other agent, you call them and say, hey, how are we doing with um, Wembley? Just checking in on escrow. Yeah, hey, you know, we're shooting for, we're shooting for the 19th. <laughs> what? Get, get the same analogy. I'm shooting, which means I have a good chance that I'm going to miss. Okay? We're not shooting for it. We're, the target, who? The contract date is the 19th. Are you going to hit the target on the 19th or are you going to miss it? I want to know now. And I'll tell you, who has had an escrow that is not closed on time? <laughs> when did you first realize that escrow was not going to close on time? Before you answer, if anybody in this room says, well, the day before is when I first realized it wasn't going to close on time, I will say, would suggest you're not doing your job. Okay. In Brad's world, he just said three weeks. So the lender knows, it sounds like three weeks earlier he wasn't going to make it. Now, sometimes the lenders withhold bad news. And they don't do it on purpose. They do it because they don't want to panic you guys. And let's just, let's just suppose, okay, we're going to close. Let me get my calendar in front of me. We're going to close on the... Okay, our close of escrow date is the 19th. Or this is made a little, little close. We're with the 12th. Okay, so we got three weeks. We love our lender. He's done a good job. Buyer seems to be performing. Everything's fine. Um, we call Brad and we say, hey, Eddie, how's it going? Yeah, it's going good. Everything's good. But there is, a, there is a challenge. There's something in the file. It's trivial. Probably doesn't need to worry us about it. But there is something that he knows he has to work on that has to be resolved in order for us to hit our date. Now, a lot of lenders, I would say most lenders, will not share that information with you. And they won't share it with because, number one, they have confidence they're going to be able to get it done and everything's fine. Or, number two, they just they know you. They know how Robin is. And they don't want Robin to freak out. You, know, you tell Robin, the whole world's going to come unglued. Oh my gosh, Brad just said this. So we've done enough business with Robin that what do we do from Robin? We withhold information from her. The bad news. And we withhold the bad news, but we do it for a good reason. We do it because we think we're trying to help Robin. Now this, is, now this has been my experience. Now it's a week later. Now we make the phone call to the lender, or maybe it's not the lender, maybe it's there's something with escrow, maybe there's something with title, maybe there's something going on. And whoever the responsible person to share the information with us now is a little more nervous than they were a week earlier, because that problem is still unresolved. But now they choose not to share it with you. Now they also choose not to share it to you for a different reason. Well, shoot, I knew last week I didn't say anything. Now they're calling me for an update, and I'm going to say, I have a problem. Now, if, if I'm the agent on the other end of that phone, I'm going to I always ask the same question. Oh, Brad, when, when did you discover this um, problem? Oh, I discovered it last week. Let me go through my notes. Oh, yeah. My memory serves me. I did talk to you last week. How come you didn't share this problem with me last week? Okay, now that's how I do business. You no, know, I didn't want to bother you. Okay, well, okay. We're going to excuse you that time. You're not allowed to do that to me again. You're not allowed to withhold that information. I don't care how minor it is. Hey, these are the 16 things I've got to get cleared up. Don't worry about them. They're all minor. We're going to close on time. How many times do one of those 16 items become a problem? And then we get to find out about it when. You know, the day before. I could show you guys so many email chains from lenders that promise loan documents the next day. And then for three weeks... Promise. You talk, we should bring Janet in here. Janet's got a terrible disposition. You know why? Because people lie to her all day long. What? To her face. They're coming. Loan ducks are coming tomorrow. Title will be clear tomorrow. It'll be delivered tomorrow. The term will be cleared tomorrow. For three weeks you've been telling me it's going to be clear. So, at any rate, all right, let's move on because we've gone on for an hour and we're still on the date. 
Okay? So, <laughs> we're going to put our date in here. All right, we're going to move on a little bit. What's the agency form? 2A. What is this saying? There's a key word on here. Who can read this? What does that word say? Prior. 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 What does prior mean? Before. Before. In advance of. Give me another one. It's got to be another one. At any rate, prior to my buyer signing this agreement, they are supposed to have in their hand a disclosure regarding real estate agency relationships, the agency disclosure form. That's what the contract says. General practice in this industry is to have that done after. Okay? Or never. Okay? At a minimum, if I'm sitting down with Tom and his wife to sign an offer, if he doesn't sign it prior to signing the contract, it's the next darn thing he's signing, or he's certainly signing before I leave his house. But the contract says that's a violation. I basically, I'm not in compliance with the contract. Before he signs the contract, and the wife signs the contract, they need an agency disclosure. We'll talk about what an agency disclosure is in the disclosure class, but it's basically the form that says, I'm representing you, I am now your agent, and these are my responsibilities. Okay? Nothing more. Very simple. By the way, is the agency disclosure a contract? No. No. It's a disclosure. So when you ask Tom to sign this, pretty simple. Tom, I need you to execute this agency disclosure before we can move forward. I just need your initials right there. Right there. I love that. You know what's amazing? When you hand someone a pen, they cannot take it. They cannot not take it. Well, you did. <laughs> you know? This is, this is the trick. Don't take this one. Give me my doily back. Can I take your If you hold it long enough, they just can't resist. It's like ice cream. Just long enough. Okay? But again, oh, I don't know. I don't want to sell the contract. I don't have time. This is not a contract. All this says, and again, you explain it to them. This is just says, what is it? You're not obligating yourself to anything. You just, this is, I need to get this. Do we move forward? We get to the next step. We'll talk more about sales, presentations, and skills, and all the rest of that. But the bottom line is they better sign the agency disclosure um, prior to signing the contract, or we're all in trouble. Okay. Item B potential competing buyers and sellers. All right? This is the DA form. What's the DA stand for? Um, help me out here. Where's the DA? It's the. Uh, it's not dual agent. agent. Is it dual agent? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, is that what I it said? It is. I don't think it it, it. it makes sense that it would be. Authorization to. You go to the authorization to represent more than one or two. Mm -hmm. Um. Where's the DA? If you go to the numeric, the policy tab, and then just hit the D key, then we'll go straight to the D. You. We teach in this class before you know it. Uh, hit the D one more. DA, come on. Oh, you, DA. you gotta click in there first. Is that what I gotta do? There it is. We're close. There it is. Uh, ah, disclosure to represent more than one buyer or seller. Kind of the dual agency deal. Okay? So, this space, now we're telling, now again, is this important in this marketplace? I suggest that you have all of your buyers and sellers for that matter sign the disclosure to represent more than one buyer or seller, irrespective of whether you have any plans of representing another buyer or seller. Okay? And all this is saying is, Tom, I have other listings out there. Oh, and by the way, you're not the only buyer I'm working with. And I'm working with Debbie. And by the way, by the way, you're you're asking for trouble. This is fraught with danger. But you know, I was holding you know how I met you. I met you at an open house on Wembley here and well, you know, I had like 45 people come through my, my open house, you know, today. And, um, you know, I have one other buyer who also wants to write an offer on this house. Can you do that? Mm -hmm. okay. You can. Is it fraught with danger? Mm -hmm. Certainly is. Is Tom or, by the way, do I have to let Tom know? Do I have to let Debbie know? Yeah. Do you now feel a little less special? Yeah. How can I do that? Or you ask the obvious question. Well, what, what do they offer? Well, they offer 2.4 million. Oh, cool. Well, I'm going to offer 2.41. Can I do that? No. 
Danger, danger. I could. I, oh, well now I just told you, now i got to go tell Debbie what you offered. Hey, Debbie, I told Tom what you offered. He's going to offer 2.41. What do you, well, I want to go 2.42. Oh, well, uh, Tom, <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way. Okay, it doesn't work that way. But you want to get it signed and executed. This also applies for listing side. I take, I take your listing, take George's listing, and George thinks I'm the only listing he has in the neighborhood. Well, what happens the next day? I put a for sale sign in your yard. The next day, the neighbor down the street who has the exact same model calls me up and says, Hey, I saw your sign book. I saw you got that house listed. It looks nice. What you listed for? Really I do my presentation. Two days later, I now have another listing on the same street for the same model. Maybe it's a better house. Maybe it's at a better price. Is my seller down the street mad at me? Maybe. Maybe not. They might think, hey, this guy's the pro. He's the neighborhood guy. I want to work with him. What happens if the listing that I took 30 days ago hasn't sold, and then I take it a model match tomorrow, and I sell it this weekend? And then I get to call my seller. I've had the listing for 30 days. They say, oh, I just sold the, I sold your exact house. I told you, you got cat poop on the lawn. On the, on the grass, on the I picked carpet. that up. <laughs> or, but maybe there was nothing wrong. It was just something. Sun came in. Okay, I get the form signed. Confirmation of the agency relationships. Who is the listing agent? Brokerage. The name of your brokerage. Coldwell Banker Pioneer Real Estate, Coldwell Banker Town and Country, Coldwell Banker Realty Center, ABC Realty. This is not this is not Debbie Donners. That is not the name of the agent. Um, then you get to check who am I representing? I'm representing in most of these cases. You're going to be representing the seller exclusively. Seller exclusively. Mm -hmm. No, this is listing agent. I'm sorry. Selling agent. Which, by the way, does that get confused? I've been doing this for 27 years. Yeah. Sometimes I get confused. Wait, am I the, yeah, am I, the I don't when I when I say I'm the listing agent, that doesn't normally confuse me because I'm a listing agent, but when you're the selling agent, mm -hmm. you are correct. I sold the house. Oh wait a minute, no, I'm not the selling agent, I'm the listing agent. Selling agent represents the buyer. 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 That was okay. the same thing too when people say broker. Like when we're a broker, it's an agent, it's a different. It's real confusing. Yeah. Especially to the public. Yeah. You know, exactly. if, if the agents get confused who the selling agent is, imagine what the what the yeah. what the what the public is gets confused. Okay, so Coble Banker ABC represents the seller. Coble Banker XYZ represents the buyer. Or, of course, if you're representing both and you click both, and now we have a true dual agency relationship. In representing a true dual agency relationship, you know my, the analogy I've always used has been you are kind of refereeing a ping pong match. Okay, if we bring up the agency form, which I think I will do because it seems appropriate, if we bring up the agency form. Agency was 80. Mm. Okay, agency disclosure regarding agency confirmation. Um, okay, you guys need to memorize this line. Okay. It's the same whether you represent the buyer or the seller. Buyer or sellers, diligent exercise of reasonable care, da 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 da. Duty of honest, fair dealings. Duty of honest and fair dealings. They, they reworded this. In good faith. In good faith. In good faith. Well, it used to say in all dealings with the buyer, um, you have a fiduciary duty of, of, of um, honest and fair dealings with all, you know, all dealings with the seller, whatever. But anyway, the bottom line is, you have a fiduciary under, uh, to your client. Buyer a. Go up a ah, here we go. This is the, this is what I say. I have to memorize. I don't have to memorize. A fiduciary. This is what I like. The utmost care, integrity, honesty, and loyalty in all dealings with your buyer. If you look at the seller side, which I think I went past, the seller side says the exact same thing. There we go. Where is it? Right there. The fiduciary, yeah. utmost care, integrity, honesty, loyalty, all dealings with the seller. That is the I cannot lie to you or steal clause. If you ever have a client calls you at some point into a transaction and says, I'm a little concerned that you haven't exercised the utmost care, integrity, honesty, or oil in dealing with me. You're screwed. Because <laughs> what they're doing is they're reading through the contract and they're like, 
Or God forbid they use the word fiduciary. Does your average person in the public selling a house know what that means? Well, if, if, if you ever have a client call you and say, I think you've breached your fiduciary duty, <laughs> you are doubly screwed. Because uh, they're looking to get out. And by the way, yeah. you probably are going to let them out. Because you probably made a mistake. You don't want, any, don't want any trouble. I like that. We don't want trouble. And I certainly don't want any trouble. Okay. So, we're going to fill out our agency form. We're going to make sure we have our confirmation of, of our agency relationships. And again, the agency confirmation is now um, built into the contract. This used to be a completely separate document, so not anymore. Now it's, it's right in here. This is who I'm representing. Okay? All right, now we get into the financing side. I was talking to Brad earlier, and I asked him to kind of sit in here with us, not so much to turn the class over to him, but I wanted him to kind of acknowledge and, and, or challenge a couple of things I'm going to say, most of which I think he's going to say, yeah, that's right. Okay? I've had people sit in this class for years that expect on the financial side for me to go into this long dissertation and teach you everything you need to know about loans. Does it say that I'm a lender anywhere mm -hmm. here? Are you guys lenders? Mm -hmm. Do you take loan applications? Do you fund loans? Have you read a set of loan documents in your life? Okay. We don't do loans. We also don't issue title insurance. And we also are not escrow officers. And last I checked, we're not licensed to do termite inspections or home inspections. We are realtors. The scope of our responsibility is to know the contract, have reasonable explanations and provide guidance to our clients, but we don't do the loan. Okay? Now, last week, we sat down and we filled out a seller's net sheet. Okay? I feel that we have a responsibility as a realtor to at least be able to explain to a seller what is your proceeds going to be, and these are going to be your costs that leads to those proceeds. I am, I've been doing this 26, 27 years. I have never once, never once, sat down with a buyer and said, this is how your loan's going to work. This is what your closing costs are going to be. This is what your down payment's going to be. This is how much money you're going to need to bring into escrow, and here's what your payment is going to be. Now, what I've said is all of those things are important, but we are now going to get you to a professional who will get you that information. And by the way, we do that before we're filling this stuff out. Okay? And I'm sure everybody in this room, and I'm sure everybody in that room, have filled out offers to purchase with buyers before they've ever talked to a lender. And they all know that that's just fraught with danger. Stupid. Better word. It's just stupid. Do they work out sometimes? Yes. Are you just asking for trouble? Yes. Okay, so let's get over here and let's figure out what we're going to do. Okay, financing terms. Initial deposit. Let's use our language carefully here. Deposit shall be an amount of X amount of bucks. Now let's come up with a more reasonable sales price. Let's take our two fifty or $2 million, take it down to $250,000. Okay, what is the question here? They want to know is... How much should it make deposit? What's the earnest money deposit, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's a reasonable earnest money deposit on a two hundred fifty thousand dollars sales price? Is it three? Hmm? Is it three? Is that what I like three. Yeah. Anybody three got percent. anything on anything else? Three percent, seventy five hundred bucks. We good with that? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand. Okay. Yes. We see an average of about what? Mm -hmm. A lot of it depends on the sales price, but okay. Tom's my okay. Let's all participate here. I have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar purchase price. I now it's time to say, okay, Tom, um, or, or Charles, or whatever your name is. Um, what's the? Um, I need a deposit from you. What are you prepared? Now, normally buyers kind of give you that glazed over look. Which, by the way, this is not this is not the best time to have this conversation. I've spent three days with this man. We've been looking at houses. We've been chatting. You know, at some point, as I'm walking through 123 Main Street on a house that he hates, and we know we're, let's get on to the next one, but we want to go check out the koi pond. So let's just check out this pond before we get here. Hey, by the way, dude, we're going to get in escrow at some point. How much money do you have available? You know, and hopefully he gives you a number that makes sense. Well, just so you know, we're going to need to come up with a deposit amount. And so we're talking about that. So when we get to this point, we've already had this discussion. Hey, remember when we were checking out the koi pond two weeks ago? We kind of talked about a 3% number would be good. You're still good with that, right? So this is easy. Boom, I don't have to spend 30 minutes talking about what the deposit's going to be. 
3% is, is good. Um, and let me tell you why. We're going to go to, um, where are we going to go? What page is liquidated damages on? Four. Page four. Mm -hmm. Page seven. Page seven. Things have changed. Liquidated damages ties in directly to your earnest money deposit. Liquidated damages. If a buyer, Tom, fails to complete this purchase because of Tom's default, the seller shall retain as liquidated damages. Damages. Don't get hung up on the word liquidated. Shall retain as damages. The deposit actually paid. Now, right now, our contract says what? 7500 bucks, mm -hmm. right? If the property is a dwelling with no more than four units, one to four, there's rules for one to four, there's rules for, for five and above, one of which the buyer intends to occupy, we're buying a single family house, that's one to four, buying a house, you intend to occupy it, then the amount to be retained shall be no more than 3% of the purchase price. Now, in most cases, who is initially off? In most cases, the contracts I look at, buyers and sellers are agreeing to liquidated damages. Mm -hmm. If the buyer and the seller agree to liquidated damages, what is the maximum amount that the seller can retain for damages? 3%. Why would I want to tie up more than 3%? Number one, it's, now again, I represent the buyer right now. I'm representing Tom. Good faith is 3%. You said 10,000 bucks. Okay, well, well, first of all, let's suppose that this deal goes south but it's not Tom's fault, okay? You now have $7,000, $7,500 in escrow. It's not your fault. Liquidated damages clause doesn't apply. Not only does it not apply, you want your money back. Buy it. I'm your agent. So we put in a cancellation instruction into escrow, and it says, please, we, we, escrow is canceled, and please return earnest money deposit to Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, the amount of $7,500. Who has to sign? Seller. Has to, buyer and seller have to sign. Yes. Mm -hmm. Seller for, for for no good reason says I'm not signing. I'm not signing. What happens to Tom's seventy five hundred bucks? It sits. It sits. It sits and waits yeah. and it waits and it waits and it waits. Do that. And if the seller is unreasonable for whatever reason, it still sits and it waits. Two years? Three years? Wow. Three years. Three years. The state to the state. S G to the state. Is it three years or two years? I thought it was two. I think it's I think it's three. But at any rate, at the end of the day, you don't get your money. If you and the buyer and the seller don't agree, at some point, two or three years, escrow should answer that. It's an escrow question we should know. But at some point, if you guys don't agree or if you don't sue each other and get it adjudicated, that money goes to state of California. See ya. This is the challenge. Now I've told my guy, let, let's suppose Tom says, man, I really want to make my offer look strong, man. $50,000. Now. I'm representing Tom, and I'm believing, dude, I love you. That's a serious offer. You are showing extreme commitment to the purchase of this deal. I would love for you to come in with the $50,000 earners money. I gotta tell you, though, that's dangerous. You're now exposing your $50,000, and if we have a nut, crackpot seller, and if something happens, I just want, I want you to know that your $50,000 is at risk. You could just sit in Ashbury. You're going to have to go sue this guy. Which, by the way, if I'm suing for $50,000, is this a small claims case? This is a small claims yes. case. Yeah. Is $50,000 a small claims case? Small. Uh -huh. I had a client of mine, scared to have a friend of mine, that um, referred me to a client, and they were buying, and tried to buy, it fell out of escrow, but, which, which is the gist of the story, tried to buy a $3 million property um, down in um, La Quinta, and they were big musician guys, lots of money. And this was not that long. I knew better. I knew better. This was 10 years ago. And $100,000 earnings money. Okay. So they're going to basically pay cash and we're going to close escrow. Man, what could go wrong? <laughs> okay, well, needless to say, things went wrong. It took us four months to get $100,000 released. I was not feeling good. To be, to be blunt, I did not represent my client very well because I put way too much of their money at risk. Way too much. And that was my fault. Thank God they got it back because I, I lost some sleep over that. Now, let's change hats for a minute. Let's suppose I'm the listing agent and I'm dealing with a nincompoop on the other end of the 
flying. And they now sit back and they give me a $50,000 deposit. Okay, I don't know if this comes across. I'm smiling. I love it. I don't represent the buyer. I represent my seller. And I want you committed. And believe me, you give me a $100,000 or $50,000 deposit on the $250,000 so you Is that buyer committed? Yeah. They should be committed. But they are committed. I love it. So if I'm the listing agent, I want huge deposits. Huge deposits. If I'm representing the buyer, I, try, I want to keep it 3%. reasonable. 3%. Now, $500 deposit. Not serious at all. Not serious. Not serious. So Tom and I are at property he doesn't like. We're at the Koi Pond. And Tom says, oh, yeah, I, I, I bought a few properties. And, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll give him a $500 earnest money deposit until I know everything's going to go good. Uh oh, time out. Red flag. 500 bucks? Are you kidding me? That's not serious. And that's exactly what I'm going to say. Tom, that's not serious. We can't do that. I at least got to get one and a half, two percent. Two percent. Yeah. At least if $250,000 property. Think of yourself as the seller. If I don't at least have a five thousand dollar deposit, we're not going to be taken serious, especially in this market. Not Are you kidding me? So at any rate, we've got to have a decent earnest money deposit. All right. So now this has changed. I kind of like this and I kind of hate it at the same time. So let me get my cursor here. We've agreed it's a seventy-five hundred dollar deposit. Let's read this carefully because this this language changed a couple years ago. Buyer shall deliver deposit directly to escrow holder. Let's just stop right there for a second. Buyer shall deliver deposit directly to escrow holder. The way the default language, well, let me, let's continue to read, by personal check electronic yeah. within three days after acceptance. Let's assume we check no boxes. Okay, so I'm on A. Who has the deposit? We write the escrow. Is Tom giving me a deposit for $7,500? No. I do not have a check in my hand. It says right here, buyer is going to deliver it directly to escrow by a personal check, electronic fund, or other methods within three days after acceptance. I do not have a copy of a check for $7,500. Now, two trains of thought. First of all, I like this. I like option A. I like it only because I'm the broker and I don't trust you. And I don't trust you behind the camera, and I don't trust those people out there. And as much as we have professional realtors that work in this office, if you make a mistake in, in doing item two, forget about item one, or if checked, buyer is given the deposit, uh, deposit or personal check to the agent submitting the offer. Who's that? That's me. Now, again, in the old days, when I was brought up and sat in these training classes, the thought of not getting my buyer to pull out the checkbook and write a check made payable to Cobo Bank or Pioneer Real Estate or made payable to ABC Escrow. If I had written an offer and I had gone into my broker and said, hey, I got an offer and check this out, looks pretty good. And my broker said, well, where's the check? And if I had come in without a deposit check, I would have had my head handed to me because I was weak and I didn't ask my client for a deposit. And the thought being, again, if they're not willing to give you a deposit, do they really want to buy the house? No. If you're not, and again, to me this has really nothing to do with being a good salesperson or even being a strong agent. This has to do with you doing your job. If you are afraid to ask your buyer to cut a check for the deposit, which by the way, I don't get that. Why would we be afraid? Do you want to buy the house? Yes. Are these the terms that you've agreed to? Yes. Well, then I need you to give me $7,500. What if they don't have the money? Well, better to find out about it today. Right? But now, this was old school, item B. Now, this is the best way to do it. You have more control of your client. You have a check in hand. But we have to document it properly. It has to get into the trust log. It has to be documented for DRE purposes, so on and so forth. Having said that, because there's so many trust fund violations and because California Association of Realtors is trying to keep us out of trouble, they've said, let's make it easier for the agents. This did not exist a few years ago. Right. Okay? This was not an option. You had to write this. If you wanted to have the buyer give the check directly to the escrow, you had to write it in. And if I was the listing agent, I would say, you're weak. 
you didn't get a deposit for your buyer, you have, you're, you're sending me a message. Not the buyer necessarily, the agent mm -hmm. is now sending me a message and the message they are sending me is, you don't have any control over your buyer. And I tell my seller, I don't think this guy has any control over his buyer. He scares me. I don't want to go into escrow with Robert. Because if he couldn't even get his buyer to give him 7500 bucks, what else can't he get his buyer to do? Now, this is becoming more common practice. So now more, and, and I just told you guys, in this office now, I would prefer that you go with option A. It's safer for us. Having said that, you need to still make sure your buyer has the money and they're prepared to write the check and they've got three days. Because what happens if they don't get it in within three days? Breach of contract. If they get the deposit in, done, you're out. Dude, I told you, I told you, you had to get that deposit in by close of escrow on Thursday or you're going to lose the house because they had 17 other offers on the darn thing and you waited until Friday morning. And guess what? We are done. You don't have that house anymore. So, it's important. You have a question back up? Uh, does HUD or FHA have to have a check? Correct. The, the deal with HUD is if you're doing FHA financing, you definitely have to have a check. And it's also non refundable. Correct. Non refundable. Got to have a check. HUD offers. By the way, did anybody go to the HUD training? I thought that? I saw you there, Robert. Yeah. It's so. $500 if it's under $50,000, and $1,000 yeah. if it's over $50,000. Correct. Little different scenario, and it's very simple to write the offer. Um, okay, so are we clear with this? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we got $7,500, this is how we're going to do it. If you are going to get a check from them, again, there's nothing wrong. There's a lot of agents that say, no way, I'm getting a check. Then check the box. What if you do? Personal check is fine. They're giving it to you. Or you could write, which you got to be careful with this, agents submitting the offer. You could write another name in here. I forget I just said that. You could write your name in there, I suppose, but that would be redundant. You are the agent submitting the offer. Um, made payable to, who do you want it to go to? That's cool. um, town and country escrow, you're not sure you're going to get the escrow, make it payable to Cobalt Bank or Pioneer Real Estate, we can hold it in our trust account until you decide where it's going to go. Okay. And then again, the deposit shall be held uncashed until acceptance, then deposited with the escrow holder or into broker's trust account, which would be the default, again, within three days of acceptance. We got to make sure we've got that money. Okay, increased deposit. Is increased the deposit the down payment? Yes or no? No. No. Increased deposit is not down payment. Be careful. I have seen dozens of offers where the agent writing the offer thinks that the increase of the deposit, well, that's the rest of the down payment. So they call Brad. Brad says, okay, well, they're going to do a a 20% down on a $250,000 sales price, so that's $50,000 down. We have a $7,500 deposit, so the balance of the down payment is $42,500. So I'm going to put $42,000 to $42,500 right there. What have I just done? I have said my deposit is now gone from $7,500 to $50,000. Not my down payment, my deposit. Deposit's at risk if escrow cancels. And then I also have to check a couple other boxes. So, well, how many days am I going to increase the deposit? Two days, five days, ten days? Okay, so you have to give them some sort of a, some sort of an option, or I can write in, you know, at the time the appraisal comes in, or whatever that needs to be. Now, if you do come in with a lower deposit, let's suppose we could go crazy with this. Let's just suppose you put in a thousand dollar deposit, um, and we should have a seven five hundred dollar deposit. But the buyer says, well, I'll tell you, I'll increase my deposit as soon as I finish my home inspection. And I'm going to put in the contract, I'm going to finish my home inspection within five days. So then you say, okay, you can put in within five days, or you can put, deposit will be increased by $5,000 within five days and upon completion and acceptance of home inspection. Okay, so now you're telling the seller, you're putting them on notice and say, hey, once I get my home inspection done, that's the main thing that I'm worried about. Or I get upon completion of the appraisal. What would be what would be the strategy behind that? Why? But honestly, not a lot of agents do. It. So it's okay. Not a lot of agents do. It. Okay. Uh, my suggestion would be if if you're going to put down a seventy-five hundred dollar deposit, put it down. Here. Put it there. All the time. Put it up there. Yeah. Um, honestly, this <laughs> this this box, the strategy behind using item B is people don't understand what it is and they make mistakes. 
most people are not. Who's written an offer in this room that says, oh, my intent is to increase the deposit after five days or ten days after open escrow? Not normally people's intent. Mm -hmm. I could show you guys a dozen offers. Matter of fact, it'll take me 30 seconds to find one. So that would be something like probably to use if you're waiting for like some plans to get approved by the city. I'll increase it X amount. Okay. If it's waiting for an appraisal, okay. waiting for an inspection. Okay. Once this, once we know that the well certifies, I'll give you more money. I just don't want to tie up all my money because there's a question as to whether or not the well is going to certify or the city inspection, the plans. And you, you come up with a thousand different examples um, on stuff like that. Um, I'll show you real quick. Um, I'll show you real quick. Bad offer. Bad, bad offer. Bad offer number one. There you go, Greg. Right. I think this has an example of what I'm talking about. Which, by the way, it used to be not that long ago. Not that I'm encouraging anybody to go work at Remax. But when I got into business 27 years ago, Remax was a new franchise and the only people that could work there were pros. They didn't know what the hell you're doing. Now they'll take anybody. Including Alexa, Alexia Hassan. Okay, are you ready for Alexia? Yeah. Let's get to her. I, I, I do a whole class on this offer. This is the worst written offer in the history of offers. Um, but let's just, do I you think. you think she's still an active agent? Are you, are, you, are you telling me or are you asking me? I'm asking. Yeah, I'm sure she is. She's probably a top producer. Probably makes a lot of money. Uh, but I, I don't know the answer. Uh, okay, here's my, oh, here it is. Here it is, see, I know I remember this. I, I went one page too, too far. One page, two page. There we go. Let's take, a, let's take a peek at this. The real offer, by the way. This offer was written by Alexia, which, by the way, this offer was written, the buyer, this offer got rejected, which is really unfortunate because the buyer was strong. Super, super strong, solid buyer with a super weak agent. This person lost this house because their agent was terrible. Can everybody see this? Mm -hmm. $260,000 purchase price, $2,000 deposit. What's this? $2, Increased deposit of $50,000. Is that what she wanted? Which, by the way, no. there's a million. Th when is this escrow closing? Nothing. It's not. Never. <laughs> okay. Agents do this all the time. $52,000. I called her up. Really? Oh, no, no, that's, that's the down payment. That's not where it goes. Okay. So, at any rate, very, very, very common. We could do a whole class on this offer. Okay, so here we are. So now we've got our, our deposit. For the most part, Tom makes a very valid point. What's the strategy? Why do we use that? You're probably not going to use it. You might be able to come up with a scenario at some point, but let's just leave it alone. Oh, yeah, loans. Now we're going to get over to Brad. Now, I, we're, we're going to do an easy one here. Okay. Question. We got a $250,000 purchase price. We said it's going to do a 20%. We're going to go conventional. We kind of know that. Now, again, if I haven't spoken with the lender that's representing Tom at this point, shame on me. I have got the cart so far in front of the horse. I might as well just say, time out. Oh, Tom, I'm so sorry. I forgot that who's doing your own again? Oh, your brother-in-law's sister's boyfriend from TJ. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, guys, it sounds funny. Most of the people that you're going to come in contact with have a relationship with a loan officer, and that relationship is their brother-in-law's sister's boyfriend from TJ. Okay? Not that there's anything wrong with TJ. I love TJ. Okay? But that's not where I want to go to get my loan. Okay? So, we have to be strong. You know, Brad's been talking about getting cross qual or listing agents and all the rest of that. Um, if you're not going to use Brad, I don't think anybody in this room has a relationship with anybody for the most part on the loan site. Um, but if you don't, there's your guy. If you do, give him a crack. See what he can do for you. But whoever it is, if, if you're going to allow the buyer to control this, just know that you are out of control. If you're going to, the buyer, I'm using this, this is the lender I'm using. Okay, would you consider talking to my lender? No. I have to use him because my mom said so. 
coming from you? Okay? If, if that's what you're going to agree to, then just know you have no control over this transaction. You are now blind. Well, I talked to the lender. They seem like a nice enough guy. Have you ever done a loan with them? No. Have they done any other loans other than Tom's loan for the first time? I don't know. Have you ever heard of the company? I think I saw them. No. Nonsense. When do we get paid? It's upon close of escrow. Hey, Tom, I understand you've got a relationship with your sister, Mars brother's mother, that's a different teaching. I get that. And to be honest with you, if, if that's a great lender, God bless them. You know, no, nothing better than your brother-in-law getting, you know, getting the credit for it and all the rest of it. Do me a favor, okay? you got to understand, I don't get paid. I've spent three days with you already. We're going to be dating here and basically getting married over the next 30 days. We've got a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money invested in this. And to be blunt, dude, I don't get paid unless this expert closes. I'm not trying to pull your business away and give it over to Brad. I'm really not. Honest to God, I'm not. But do me a favor. It's going to take Brad 15 minutes on the telephone. Just please talk to him. He's going to verify everything that you've already told to... Da, 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 da. Brad's going to come back, and it's two things are going to happen. Number one, he's going to hopefully verify exactly what, you're, what you've already been told. If so, I'll sleep better at night. You should also sleep better at night because now you've got independent verification that the referral that you got from da, 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 is a legitimate referral. Okay? And then we move forward, and we can use your, your sister-in-law, your brother, happens, whatever it happens to be. Or, you know, quite honestly, something else may happen. You may share some information with us that's a concern that we need to know. That maybe you weren't so maybe your credit's not as good as you thought it was. Or maybe you think that you qualify for this program and you don't. Or you think that you're going to get a 3% interest rate, but you can't. Um, or whatever it happens to be. It's 15 minutes. i got to tell you, if my buyer won't do me the courtesy of a phone call to my preferred lender after I've spent countless hours with them, you are not my buyer. You're not my buyer, okay? I get paid at close of escrow. I am not going to go into a 30-day relationship with you with my fingers crossed that this lender is going to perform. I'm not going to do it. And quite honestly, that's one of the problems with this business because there's a lot of newer agents, a little less experienced, a little timid, a little shy, don't want to rock the boat. They're just so happy. <laughs> oh my God, they're just so happy. They, you go home to your spouse. They signed the contract. I am a professional realtor. I got them to sign. Okay, well, great. You got them to sign. What are the chances of them closing? I have no idea. <laughs> but they signed. Woo! Who, who's had their first contract signed? I think everybody in this room has at least one did, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty damn good feeling, right? When you, get, you get that first listing signed, that first con. You know what? I, I remember both of mine. I, at the time they signed, honestly, I could care less whether the <laughs> listing was going to sell or whether the escrow was going to close. It was the farthest thing from my mind. I was so happy. They signed. That was a check. The yeah. last thing in the world I want to do is mess up that great moment. But to find out that, crap, they sign, but they'll never close, okay? Now, when you do that first deal, or that second deal, that feeling of getting the signature is so overwhelming, you forget. And then you get burned. Once or twice, however many times it takes. And for those of you in the room, I don't know how many times you've been burned. But you will get burned. And at some point, whether it's the first time or the tenth time, what I'm telling you right now will click, and you will say, never again. I am not going to go into escrow with anybody who won't do me the courtesy of at least talking to my lender. I don't care who you are or who the relationship is. Yeah. I wanted to share, we had the meeting, sales meeting in Claremont today, and this is the question I just want you to think about. Have you dealt with another agent that a, you're surprised they're in the business, how they got in the business, or how they even got a license. Have you, have you ever met one of those? Most. Just let me share something with you. As loan officers, I have the same issues. How did they get in the business? How did they get hired where they're working? And God, how did they pass their annual exam every year? Because they don't have a clue what they're talking about. 
and you don't know which one that is. That is not the exception to the rule. That is the rule. The vast majority, this is the deal. We can probably get by with a less than stellar title company. Okay? We can probably get by and close escrow with a less than stellar escrow company. I wouldn't recommend it, but we can get by with it. Um, more than likely, if we've got a bad lender or a bad agent, <clears throat> we're sunk. Okay? And the, the level of, ex of expertise in our, in, I, 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 then again, by the way, we are, we are going to get through page one, I promise. We're on the um, okay, question. Most of you have heard me ask this question a, a thousand times. You, I've never asked this question to. Okay? Nobody else can answer. Okay. How many escrows does the average real estate agent close in a 12 month period? Three, four? Three in a year? Okay. That's actually a pretty good answer. Having said that's wrong. <laughs> most of the time, and Brad says six, most of the time when I ask that question of brand new licensees, which is a pretty kick in the face, you know, someone brand new coming to the business, I think I want to get my real estate license. The answer I get is, well, it's only kind of like one or two a month, right? Okay, well, one or two, okay, one or two, okay, one a month would be 12, two a month would be 24. That's normally the answer I get. So you said three or four, which would be you know one every three months or four months, whatever it happens to be. Now let's define average for a minute. Let's just suppose we have a thousand realtors in, in our area. So 500 of the thousand, the bottom half, close. Are you ready? Zero. Zero. Now, if we let's take the, the, the 501 to the 700 realtors level. One. One deal. Let's take the 700 to the 800 deal. Two, two and a half, maybe. So, in other words, 80%. Yes. George Lawson wants to know if you're meeting at 3 today. Yeah. We're going to, well, 315. Okay. Come on, come on. All right. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, we're good. Tell, okay. tell him three fifteen, and we're gonna. He's gonna buy me lunch. Um, okay. <laughs> cool. Um, okay. So we've got a thousand realtors. Ready? Eight hundred of the thousand close less than two deals a year. About six hundred of the thousand close nothing. Nothing. Zero. Okay. You. By closing three or four deals, you're in the you're somewhere in the top, top nine, fifteen to twenty percent of agents. Okay, that's exceptional. Someone closing four deals a year. Okay, so with that in mind, you get an experience level. Same thing with lenders, by the way. In fact, the lenders ho hopefully in theory should have a little bit better odds than than, than the realtor for realtor. Mm -hmm. But the chances of you getting a dingleberry or a huckleberry or a, a nincompoop on the other side of the transaction are huge. And how would you like to be on the opposite side of that deal? Our income, let's just pretend for the moment we're the listing agent. No, no, we're the buying side. So our, and we're dealing with brand new agent over here, never closed the deal in his life. We need him. We need him. We need a strong, professional, educated, knowledgeable realtor to guide his seller through the process so that we can get this thing closed. Because if we don't close, not only does he not get paid, I don't get paid, and my income is in his hands. Unless I do his job for him. Which is probably what most of us will end up doing. We'll end up doing both people's jobs. As politely and professionally as we can, because we don't want to piss him off. <laughs> Pain of them. Okay, let's get, let's get through this long side. Okay, we've said we're going to do a 20% conventional, so we talk to our lender, and our lender says, he does the math for us, and says the loan amount's going to be $200,000. Great, so we plug in the $200,000. What kind of loan are we doing? Well, I don't know. What does your lender say? The lender says we're going to do conventional financing, which is the default. The default is conventional. If he says FHA, then we check the FHA box. If he says VA, that's the VA box. If we say seller carry back, you're going to come talk to me. A whole different class, five-hour class on seller carryback. 
Okay? Are we going to assume financing? You're going to come talk to me. Okay? I'm not going to do a lot of assumptions and stuff anymore. It's just not out there. So, we're going to do conventional financing. We don't have to check the box. This is what's our interest rate going to be. And I'm talking about You don't want to pull out a newspaper. Well, I got a thing in the thing today, and it said that I can get, you know, 2.5%. Talk to Brad. Can Tom get 2.5%? No. His down payment's wrong, his credit's wrong, his income's wrong, his credit's wrong, whatever's wrong. I mean, you can get a loan, but you can't get that rate. You're going to get three and a three quarter or whatever it happens to be. Well, why? I don't know why. Talk to the lender. Did he give you a reasonable explanation? I think so. Are you doubting it? I think so. Well, then go talk to another lender. If he tells you the same thing or something different, then you go back and challenge him. And say, hey, Andy Heflin at Wells Fargo said that I could get that rate. Brad? <laughs> well, what about this, 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 and this? Let's go. Oh, go back. Hey, my, Andy, you know, Brad said, what about the. Oh, well, oh, he actually ran your credit. Yeah, you ran your credit. Oh, I didn't run your credit. I just, I just assumed, you know. You just talked to me over the telephone. I didn't realize. Well, you actually filled an application. He has your income. He has your expense. He has your years on the job. He has your, your bankruptcy papers. Oh, you filed bankruptcy. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. So at any rate, give us an interest rate. Now, normally, if Brad says that an interest rate not to exceed, let's say, three and three quarters, I'm putting four and a half in here because I don't want you to blow out of the deal because the interest rate went up a quarter percent. Because you could. You could blow out of the, oh, now he can't get you three and three quarter. Rates went up. We didn't lock in and whatever program wasn't available. Now you're getting three and seven eighths, so you're blowing out of the deal. I don't want you. And I'm going to tell you, I'm putting in a higher rate. Why are you doing that, Lance? I don't want you to, are you going to cancel if the rate goes up a quarter percent? If you say yes, data point. Okay, so you are going to cancel. Yes. Hmm. Okay, Brad, what, what, what can we do to make sure we get him locked in? Can we get this done? And Brad says, no, we can't lock you in because of for whatever reason, or if there's a problem, or if the trend is that interest rates are going up, and you're telling me point blank, if you can't get that rate, you're not going to buy? No. I don't get paid unless we close escrows. I want to avoid the possibility of you blowing out of it. And I'm going to tell you, there's no, no trickery here. I'm telling you point blank, this is what we're going to do. Okay, so this is my interest rate. Am I doing it adjustable? If I am, you plug in the loan, so on and so forth. Regardless of the type of loan, Buyer shelf pick points. It's so funny. Nobody uses the word points anymore. Points used to be just, you know, points, 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 points. We're going to use points. No, nobody asks for points anymore. They ask for lump sums. Okay? Well, I need 3%. 3% for what? 3% for points? Is there a difference between the, uh, which, oops, I'm in the wrong column. I'm sorry. Buyer shall pay X amount, X amount of points. So this is what he's agreeing to pay. So he's, so he's going to pay X amount of, of discount points for this loan. Brad's going to tell you what those points are. Maybe it's zero. Which, by the way, are points different than loan origination fee? Yeah. Yes. Loan origination fee is normally 1% of the loan. Yes. Is that considered a point? Well, it is a point, but it's not a point. Not a point. Loan origination is one thing, 1% 1 of the loan amount. Loan discount points is another thing, 1%, 2%, 3% of the loan amount. Okay. Who needs to clarify that with your buyer? Not me. He needs to know. So when, when Brad says, Tom, this is your down payment, this is your closing cost, this is what your closing costs are, loan origination, discount point, escrow fee, title fee, garbage fee, dock fee, garbage fee, garbage fee, garbage fee, garbage fee, this is what you need. Tom says, okay, that's reasonable. That way, if you do everything you're supposed to do, and if those fees and points don't line up, then we go back to Brad. They do, what happened? You know, you overcharge, you get your point. You, you misquoted my, my boy over here. Everything's perfect. It's exactly what you said. You guys screwed up. You misquoted it. The whole bank did something wrong. The world went crazy. And you were having a bad day. You gave him a bad, you gave him a bad good faith. Okay? Not me. I don't know what you're going to do. So we're going to put that money in here. Second loan. Are we doing a 80-20? They even exist anymore. <laughs> I haven't seen a whole heck of a lot of offers written with a first and a second. Those days appear to be gone, um, at least for our argument's sake. If you're going to put a second in there, that's of course where it was. Just saw the 80-10. 80-10. There, there, there you go. We go way back to the 80-20s in no time at all. The market is, everyone has forgotten. <laughs> okay, FHA or VA. Are we going to do FHA or VA? If so, this would tie in up here. It would say we're doing an FHA, and it would say 
for any FHA loan specific buyer has 17 days unless you change after acceptance to deliver to seller a written notice on the card form or an acceptable form. Lender required repairs. Where are you going to get lender required repairs from? Appraisal. Appraisal. Lender required, if you're doing FHA, and by the way, and we're going to stop at the end of this page, when next week, which by the way, it doesn't take one day to do one page, with the next, couple, next seven pages go a lot faster. But this 17 days ties into the appraisal contingency, which by default is how many days? 17 days. So if you're going to change the one, you better change the other. So if you tighten up your appraisal, and by the way, if you do that, who's going to answer whether we tighten up the appraisal contingency? Not me, him. And we're going to say, Brad, we're trying to do a super fast FHA deal. Can we get the appraisal in 17 days? He's going to say yes, no, or maybe. And by the way, maybe is a no. So if he says, yes, we can get the appraisal in 17 days, then we can leave it the way it is. He may say, are you kidding me? They're so backed up, and I, it's out of my control, and geez, I don't know, I think we need 30 days to get the appraisal. Then what are we going to change? We're going to change this to 30 days, and then on the financing appraisal contingency, we're going to change that to 30 days. I don't answer that question. He answers that question, and I bet you guys a $1,000. If I was to go back and I was to pull every single agent that wrote an offer in this office or any office and said, when you wrote the offer, did you ask your lender if you could get the appraisal done in 17 days? Is that enough time? Forget about whether it's FHA, because if we go to appraisal contingency, appraisal contingency, what was that? Now, we're talking about FHA on page one. Now we're on page two. I'm skipping ahead. Appraisal. This has nothing to do with FHA. This has to do with any loan. The appraisal contingency is what? Going back to my, my example, if I was to pull 1,000 agents who wrote an offer in the last month and say, did you ask the lender doing the loan on the behalf of your buyer if they could get the appraisal done within 17 days, I bet most of them would look at me like, but am I supposed to ask that? Really? And the real answer would be no. They never asked. How many times, who in this room has been in an escrow where you were pushed up against a 17-day appraisal contingency and didn't make it? Mm -hmm. Tom's the only one? No, that's cool. Debbie, Michael? Yeah. Right it seems like every single deal that I'm involved with, with financing, we're on the listing agent, it's day 16, and I'm like, where's the appraisal at, lady? It's day 17. Oh, they told me it's ordered. Well, I know you said you told me you ordered a week ago. Nobody's been to the house. Nobody's called for access. Did you ask the lender? Now, again, a lot of times, is it completely in your control? No, but you might have at least an That's idea. The Huh? Especially Debbie's. Okay. Now, but he, so he's going to say, I don't know. And then we're going to say, can you give me a feel on the last few that have been going through your office? Can we get them done? Oh, yeah, it looks like they've been getting done pretty quick. 17 days pretty quick? I don't know, man. I think you need 30 days. Huh? I would say on conventional and FHA, not a problem in the current market. VA, it's a different animal. There you go. So we need to have this conversation. We need to talk to our lender and say, can you get this done? And that's just the appraisal. Because can we close without the appraisal? No, we cannot. So let's go back to the um, bottom of page one. You haven't missed anything, Chris. We're only on page one. <laughs> <laughs> You're surprised. Um, okay, so um, where am I? VAFHA. <laughs> Loan specified has 17 days from acceptance to get the um, blah, blah, delivered. Lender required repairs. Lender require, required repairs. They're not Brad necessarily. It's the appraisal. <coughs> VC sheet. VC sheet on the appraisal says roof tiles cracked and missing. Um, Chipped paint. Chip FHA, the, the fascia paint Eaves. is coming off. Eaves. 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 What? I got a paint. FHA deal. You know, you got it. They don't like that chipping paint on the eaves. 
you know. Now again, your seller agreed to accept an FHA offer on a house that's dilapidated. Well, that's a problem. You, in this case, me, I chose to write an offer. Now, Graham, we said this is conventional. Let's change it to, to FHA. I chose to write an offer for Tom on an FHA deal on a house that... Um, that we have a pool with no water in it. Pool with no water. <laughs> What's the problem with that? That's, that's dangerous. No that's a problem. That's actually a pool with no water. Forget about whether it's dangerous or not. Um, by the way, if, if I, I'm Fannie Mae, let me put my Fannie Mae hat on. Yeah. Would they rather have a pool empty or full? Hmm? What's more dangerous, an empty pool or a full, full pool? Empty pool. Yeah, empty. They don't like empty pools. Are, are they paying to uh, get them covered? Um, put all the in some up. cases they are. Have you seen how they cover? Yeah. Yeah. That's more, more dangerous. dangerous. I think the covered pools sometimes are more dangerous than the non-covered pools. They look like they're covered, but they're holes. So somebody steps on it, you fall right through. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I got to show you this house, and then we're, we're done. I just, I'm just I'm getting a little silly here, but this is this is my FHA example. I sold this house. It's honest to God, it's a real house. What are you looking for? Do, do you have to have a stove for an oven? Yes. Yes. On FHA. No stove. No oven. No. You know, you know, you know, you know. Only if it was a built-in to start with. If it's not a built-in, if it's a freestanding unit, it does not have to be there. Oh really? That's right. How about a termite report? No. no, not a problem. There we go. Yeah. Unless the appraiser comes back and says there's evidence of termite, you must have a termite then. Then, and if you have any section one termites, it has to be repaired. Wait, go back to the stove. What happens? If it's a freestanding stove, not a built-in, uh -huh. it is not required by any lending institution to be present at sale. Wow. I'll give you one more. Do you have to have an air conditioning unit? No, no. Really? Heating only. Heating only. So, if the condenser is gone for the air conditioner, do you have to have it? Nope. But the HVCC plate has to be there, covering the wires. Mm. Debbie, you remember that property of San Bernardino? I don't know if we were working together on that one or not. Which one? The one that was just totally destroyed. Gosh, I'm not that I don't have this thing earmarked. I couldn't to tell you. It was I, I was going to say Seventh Tree. Did I show this to you guys once before? It couldn't have been 2000. No, I saw that one. On 7th Street, yes, yeah, so that one. No, oh, jeez. Uh, I don't remember. Happy that one. Nah, that ain't that. At any rate, no? bottom line is I'm going to show you just a silly house that, you know, you would, not, you would forget about writing an FHA offer on this. You would never write anything other than cash because you just won't finance it. It's a disaster. So, time for lunch. Time for lunch. <laughs> Two minutes and we're out. Two minutes and we're out. Two minutes. Um, so, just the the bottom line is, I'm not going to write an offer for Tom on an FHA transaction that I just know won't finance FHA without explaining the situation. I know we've got peeling paint all over the eaves. There's roof tiles that are missing. We have issues. I'm telling you right, right up front, we're going to have a problem. I mean, how are we going to address this? Do we have a cooperative seller? We get on the phone with the listing agent. This is what I'm doing. This is not a game. In this market, are we asking for trouble? This is why FHA buyers are just they're just completely shut out. They don't have an opportunity to do anything anymore. I mean, they're just out of the deal. But again, so we are our own worst enemies when it comes to this stuff. So really quickly, lender require repairs. You're going to find them. And by the way, this is another thing. This kind of goes hand in hand with Debbie uh, and, and Anna's example. They had an agent called them and said, hey, I think we're going to have problems with the appraisal. Let's renegotiate before the appraisal was done. Okay. Well, okay. that's a problem. How do we you know, get the, we'll pay for the appraisal? Let's get the appraisal and we'll see what the price is. Okay. Same thing with repairs. You'll have buyers all the time that will ask you for a stove, ask you for a termite, ask you for new carpet, okay? And then you get the appraisal and says, well, I don't see any of those items on the appraisal. Okay, just because your home inspector came out and said, it needs a stove, which by the way you knew when you wrote the offer, and FHA doesn't require it. And um, you saw that the carpet was serviceable, but not great when you wrote the offer. If it's not on the appraisal, it ain't gonna be done. Yep. Isn't it if you put it on the page two of the RPA, you can? I mean, you, you, we could put those things in a different place, oh, you know, okay. irrespective, okay. Now, great question, and we're, again, we're almost done. We get through the lender require repairs. 
Chris is now representing Tom, and Chris has been through this rodeo a couple times, and he knows that the FHA appraiser is not going to call out the stove, but he knows that Tom wants a stove. So he just writes in there, seller to replace stove, you know, da, 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 da. which again, is that a problem? First of all, you, you know that Tom wants a stove, you write it up, irrespective of what the appraiser says, you now have it covered. Seller to replace stove prior to close of escrow. Got it covered, right? Everyone's happy, right? What does the seller put in there? Cheapest the stove. The biggest piece of crap. Mm -hmm. I mean, the cheapest of the cheap. Well, they put it in the stove. Now you're doing you your final with Tom. <laughs> Tom comes in, turns to Chris. What the heck is this? Really? <laughs> not quite exactly what, what I have in mind. Stainless steel? Oh, gas. Okay. Not a stainless steel. Right? <laughs> okay. Has the seller complied with the contract? Yes. 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 Did Chris kind of do what he was supposed to do? Yes. Does Chris have a problem? Yeah. Probably. Do buyers become complete jerks at that point in time? And now, not only do they forget it, by the way, what's the cheapest stove you can get at Home Depot? 200 bucks. Yeah, 200, 250 bucks. Super duper cheap. And of course, they go from up from there. But now, now, now we use the reasonable man standard. Well, what's that? Well, Chris now looks at it. Oh, gee, now you're right. That's a pretty cheap one. Now this this one over here for three ninety is pretty nice. Tom's like, excuse me, Bosh. have you met my wife? Uh, I want this one. Oh, you want the fourteen hundred dollar one? Yeah. Give me more money. Well, I know, but it's but again, that's not the type of problem. We do not. The whole point of these classes is to avoid that example. You guys aren't getting paid enough to be spending an extra thousand dollars for a stove. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do that, and Chris is absolutely right, cover this, cover yourself, but be specific. Mm -hmm. I want the seller to put in a stove. Tom, what kind of stove are you going to be happy with? Let's go online. The Viking. I want Viking. the Viking model 17,000. <laughs> right. Okay? Yeah, and that's what the seller is going to put in at their expense. If not, get a credit or do something different because they're not going to be happy. Well, then increase the purchase price. The increase the purchase price. Don't or get rid of it. Get or get rid of it. Say, dude, have this conversation with Tom. Tom, this is, I'm going to put this thing in here. I know you really want to stove earlier. I'm going to put a thing in here. I'm going to say, seller to install stove particles. I'm going to install a piece of crap. You're not going to be happy with it. And you might as well, you might as well just, rather than negotiate a stove or any repairs, any repairs, I tell you, let's do this. What is all this stuff worth to you? Uh, about about 2500 bucks to make me happy. Okay, tell you what, I'm going to take our offer to 247.5. Okay? You're taking it as is. You can put in your own stove, you can get your own pool equipment, you can put in your own special, I know that the screens on the back of the house are, are messed up and you want to put in... You want to put in the super nice vinyl ones that your dog can scratch and it doesn't get. You know the, the owner's going to put in those stupid aluminum cheapo ones. Don't negotiate repairs in that fashion. We're not we're not stove salespeople. Okay? Negotiate the price. Get all that crap out of there. Is your offer cleaner? You bring an offer to a seller in this market and you're telling the seller to put a stove in, you might as well be asking them to send you to the moon. You want to put a stove in? Are you kidding me? Even in a good market, take that crap out. Negotiate price. Okay, I think we're done. We've got this. Well, we're almost done. Additional financing terms, put whatever you want in there. We'll come back to that and revisit this next week. Um, if we put our price in right, which we didn't, I think we left the thing out here. This, I don't think we put our loan amount up here. Mm -hmm. this, this will be the balance of our purchase price. We'll talk about that next week. And of course, here's our purchase price, <coughs> our initial, so on and so forth. So, next Thursday, we're going to take three minutes on the bottom of page one. We'll take two hours. We'll probably do all page two. Frankly, page one and page two are the most important. Page two is who pays for what, right? right. So we're going to go through that. We'll take two hours going through that. The following Thursday, we'll do page um, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We'll finish up. Those are pretty boilerplate, not real complicated. Um, and we'll get the video posted here in a few days.